Hi everyone. One question that I've seen come up a few times now on Reddit and on YouTube is, I have a busted gear of some kind, how can I get a replacement? Now to get that replacement, whether you want to make it or buy it, you need to know its parameters. And specifically, you need to know the module, the number of teeth and the pressure angle. The number of teeth is quite easy. What I recommend you do is mark one tooth on one of the gears and then simply start counting. Only just remember whether you count this tooth as number zero or number one. 20, 20 teeth. The next thing we need to know is the module, which is a measure for how large the teeth are. Now in a previous video, I covered that the outer diameter of a gear is the module times the number of teeth plus two. And this is very useful because the outer diameter is something that you can easily measure. So the module is the outer diameter divided by the number of teeth plus two. And so if we go to these gears over here, I can quite easily measure for this gear that the outer diameter is about 44.1 millimeters. And so we know now that the module is 44.1 divided by 20 plus two, and that's 22, is roughly two. So this is a module two gear. It's also possible that your gear is based on the inch standard system. Now, usually there are clues for this. For example, the thickness of this gear is about 12.8 millimeters. And if I just convert that to inches, we get about a half inch. And the same thing with the hole, for example, that comes out to almost a half inch. And so this provides the first clue that this is an inch standard gear. And of course, if you have machinery from the US or you're in the US or other measurements in the machine are coming out to inches, that gives you more clues that it's an inch standard gear. The other thing you can do is simply do this procedure as before. So now we see that the outer diameter of this gear in millimeters is 46.6, .6, give or take. So we have 46.6 still divided by 22 because this is also a 20 tooth gear. And that is roughly speaking 2.11. And what we will do now is we will take 25.4. That is the number of millimeters in an inch and divide that by this number here, 2.11. And that will be about 12.03. And what that tells you is that the diametral pitch is 12.03, which is how Americans measure the size of gear teeth. Now, the important thing here is that it is on the outset, not clear whether you have a metric or an inch standard gear. But in this case, we have 2.11, which is about 5% away from a metric preferred value and we have 12.03, which is only about a quarter percent away from a US preferred value. So this provides a very strong clue that the diametral pitch is preferred. Uh, I will leave a link down below, which has a table of all the preferred values in both inch and metric systems. The final number that you need to know is the pressure angle. Where the module determines how large these teeth are, the pressure angle determines their exact shape. This number is quite difficult to figure out, but luckily there are only very few preferred values, which are 14 and a half, 20 and 25 degrees. Of these, 20 degrees is by far the most common and every general purpose gear will be a 20 degree pressure angle. Now, 14 and a half degrees was popular in the past, but has not been standard since the early 1980s. And in very high torque applications, you may encounter 25 degrees or even 22 and a half degrees, but really that is quite rare. Now, the best way to get an idea of what your gear is, is to generate gears in your CAD software with the right module or diametral pitch and the right number of teeth but with the varying pressure angles of 14 and a half, 20, maybe 22 and a half and 25 degrees. And then you can check visually, you can compare your gear between the gears generated by your CAD software to figure out which pressure angle matches best. It's almost certainly going to be 20 degrees, to be fair. 
There are also a few other numbers that you might need. For example, you might want to know how high the teeth are or how high the gear as a whole is, but I trust that you can just measure those things yourself. So the next trick I want to show you is especially useful for very oddball gears with stub teeth, weird tooth profiles, sprockets or gears that are really, really busted. Here I have a regular multifunction printer that includes a flatbed scanner, which we can use to create a scan of the gear. Now for this, we can just keep the lid open and for best results, for the most contrast, I recommend turning off all the lights in the room. Also, don't forget to scan to an image, not to a PDF. I'm now in Fusion 360, though of course you can use whatever CAD software you like. And under Insert, I'll select Canvas. And then I'll select this file over here and put that on the bottom plane. And I find that these images are easier to work with if you have the opacity turned up a little bit. So I've got it to 80 now. And then click OK. And Fusion 360 doesn't really know the size or scale of this image, so we need to tell it. So right click here and select Calibrate. And then I know that the outer edge of this tooth here to the outer edge of the opposing tooth over here is going to be 65 millimeters. And of course, that's something that I've measured. And now we can start tracing this image or we can start generating gears with the generator with different pressure angles to compare it to the canvas that we have here. What I want to do today is reverse engineer this sprocket that I have. And so I scanned the sprocket, but that didn't really work very well because it's black, so it doesn't show up. Now you can, of course, paint the sprocket white so that it shows up anyway. But what I did instead is use my overhead camera rig to just take a photograph from above. So you have to ensure that the camera is properly perpendicular to the surface. Uh, and then you can just import that as usual. So now let's start tracing this image. The first thing I'll do is create a new sketch, of course, on the same plane that the canvas is on. And I'll hit C for circle and draw out two circles. The first one will be 66.2 millimeters. That's the outside diameter that I've measured. And the other will be 7.8 millimeters. That's the diameter of the center hole that I've measured. And now I'll start dragging these two circles around until I find that they correctly match the teeth and also the inside of the sprocket. And this looks about right to me. Uh, don't forget that when you're dragging these circles around, you can hold control to prevent them from snapping to the grid. The next thing I'll do is use the lock constraint to fix everything in place. And tracing an image like this is basically the only case where you would use such a lock constraint. The next thing I want to do is select a tooth that I'm going to trace. So if I look at these teeth, for example, over here, then the edges are not really clearly defined. They're a little bit unsharp. But over here, I have one tooth, or at least one flank of a tooth, that is quite sharp and quite well defined. So that's the one that I'm going to trace. I hit L for line, and I draw a line out from the center to the edge of the circle. And I'm trying to put that roughly in the middle of the tooth. And then I'll draw two more lines from the center to the edge of the circle. And those lines are going to be symmetric across the initial line that we drew. And the angle between those two lines is going to be 360 degrees divided by the number of teeth on the sprocket, which is 12. And this essentially delineates the sector where we need to trace. So the next thing I'll do is go to spline, fit point spline. And then I'll start from this point over here and then holding control so that we don't get any automatic grid snapping. I can start tracing the profile of this tooth. And of course, I want to end up on that sector delineation that we drew earlier. Click OK here. And at this point, you can still start dragging around some of these points to try to get a better fit. And once you're happy with it, you can select it all and press lock. And then the next thing we'll do is go to create mirror. And then I'll select all of these. The mirror line is going to be the center here and click OK. 
And then the final thing that we'll do is select all of this here, create circular pattern. The center point is the center point of the circles that we had before. And then the quantity is going to be 12. Click OK, finish the sketch, E for extrude, and then we can select all of this and extrude that up by, let's say, six millimeters. And then there we have a 3D model of the sprocket. And of course, you can also uh, trace out the holes if you wish. There's one final trick that I wish to show you. And for this, I've gone back a few steps to where we only have one of these teeth traced out. And the first thing I'll do is select a circle here and hit X to turn it into construction geometry. And then I'll draw two construction lines from this endpoint over here to this other endpoint over here, like so. And then I'll make these two construction lines again symmetric around that center axis that we had before. And then I'll constrain the angle between these two lines to be, let's say, 360 divided by 14 teeth. And so from here, we can go to a circular pattern. And we're going to select the tooth again. And the center point is now going to be this point over here. And I want 14 of those. And then click OK. And then we can finish the sketch, E for extrude. And now we can extrude this bit up by, let's say, 6 millimeters. And what we have now is a sprocket of 14 teeth rather than the 12 that we started with. It's not totally mathematically accurate this way, but in many cases it should be good enough. I hope that was useful to you. Thanks for watching. If you don't mind, do the algorithm things down below, and have a great day.